Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm afraid you'll be uh, a bit disappointed because I forgot my guitar so that it won't be a, a rock concert. And uh, this, is, this will be more about uh, media art and the kind of thing I know better. Uh, another point is uh, that my Russian is not as good as I would like, and so I will try to do it in French. And, um, and first I would like to thank uh, Natalia Fuchs and Sredka for inviting me to, uh, to talk about uh, my work and certain considerations around what, um, what is uh, my uh, conception of media art uh, after something like 30 years, let's say 20 to look younger, um, years of uh, practice in the field. So, uh, Actually, uh, you know, I've been working a lot on interactivity, so uh, uh, it's a game. It's very simple. Uh, to play, you just have to interrupt me if you can and ask a relevant question. Or say something relevant anyway. So you just interrupt me, you say, oh, yeah, I would like to say something. It's your turn. So it's totally open, but of course, you have to be the first. And, uh, and, uh, and also the second, and uh, you can interrupt me as many times as you want anyway. Um, any question? Good. So, um, let's start. I, 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 will, I will speak about very different things, so uh, everybody should be happy with one minute of what I said. First, uh, I have to talk about a very uh, simple thing. That is probably at the origin of most of the things I've done uh, during, uh, during this time. I've been working with uh, new media. And uh, so uh, the thing is virtuality. You know, people talk a lot about, uh, about the virtual. And uh, if, I try to, if I try to figure out what is common between the different works I've been doing, it's virtuality. It's the fact to introduce virtuality inside the artistic practice. What is virtuality? That's, of course, something important. This is the required condition of the real. Why it is a required condition of the real? Just imagine. Imagine just before the Big Bang. You remove you removed virtuality from the world, and suddenly you understand that the Big Bang cannot happen. No Big Bang. Nobody here. I'm not here in front of you talking. No world around us. Nothing. Virtuality is this possibility of the world to become something else from what it is. So if everything would be static, with everything predated to mind, no virtuality, so no world, no you, no me, and nobody here. So maybe it would be a good thing, but there is a fact that the world is made of virtuality. And this is something that we have to keep in mind to understand that some kind of artistic practice nowadays are using virtuality as a medium. And so virtuality as a medium means that we can build something that is creating the potentiality, the virtuality of provoking something different according of the difference of people. So, the big difference that happened probably uh, with the introduction of uh, real-time, thanks to technology, uh, is that virtuality became a component of the representation, a component of the techniques of representation. What do I mean? It's very simple. Imagine a painting. In a painting, there is, of course, a form of virtuality. It's how you perceive it, how you receive the painting. And this is, of course, something that the painter cannot imagine all the time. He can imagine a lot of things, but you probably imagine something else. But actually, the painting doesn't care about the fact that you're here or not. The painting doesn't know if you're here. The painting doesn't know that you exist. Actually, the shape of the painting, the, the material 
on the surface won't change. Whatever happened, except fire, water, warmth, and things like that, they could create an unexpected evolution that is the last form of virtuality that we have known in art uh, until we develop some other things. Virtuality in a movie, same thing. There is a linear construction, and you discover this construction uh, minutes after minutes, and it will be in front of your eyes the same thing for everybody. It can be in your mind something different for everybody. But what you observe is the same because this movie has nothing, doesn't care at all, but the fact you are not, you are or are not in front of it. So the, the big change uh, during the last decades is the fact that suddenly we exist for the artwork. We exist. The existence for the representation is something pretty new. It didn't exist before. It exists only for the live show. In a theater play, uh, here, if you react, there is no computer, but maybe I will react to you. So there is a kind of uh, uh, existence. You exist for me. If there is nobody else, I stop speaking, talking. I say nothing. So there is a form of virtuality. But for image... This was not possible before we create something in real time. Uh, so I have to say what is real time, and uh, it will become uh, more understandable, understandable. So real time is when what you perceive is produced at the time you see it. And of course, you can imagine, for example, that when you see uh, something like Avatar, 3D graphics, they are not made in real time. It takes hours for one image. It takes one day for one second. It takes one month for uh, one minute or more just to render it. But when you are immersed, for example, in virtual reality, the world is supposed to react in real time. If I turn ahead, I want to see that now. I don't want to wait one minute, one day, one month to see that. Otherwise, I don't believe in this world. It's not about only about believing. It's not about believing. It's just about understanding uh, that the representation you are in is actually made in a way that you have a kind of coherent relation to the world. And what the artists want to say is the very nature of this relation, is how you actually interact with this world. And the first form of interaction is to exist. The fact you exist change, change the representation. For example, I, would, I wouldn't be here, I wouldn't exist here now, you wouldn't be here, you wouldn't be listening, watching, or doing something else. So the fact you exist, even if you say nothing, if I say nothing, You're still watching. So there is something happening. Don't, don't imagine that I do that all the time. I'm just trying to adapt to the audience. And you look like a good audience, so I have to adapt carefully. Presence. This is exactly that. This is about presence. I exist, and some other people exist, and maybe in the same representation we can exist together. Experience. Watching is a specific kind of experience where we, we get something from the painting, for example. I go back to that. I think it's a good reference. And my experience is uh, the experience of the viewer. If I'm inside a representation, everything that will happen will provoke for me another kind of experience. And if what I do has an impact on the what's going on, then this experience becomes more complex. I don't say it's better. I really believe the experience just to exist is enough. So the difference is that we have been going from attention, what we do in front of the painting, to action. And action 
is something you do after perception, after emotions, after understanding, and then you act. You act on something. The result of this is a dialogue you establish with the work. There is a work, and you dialogue with the work. You're not really dialoguing with the work. You're interacting with the work, and you're dialoguing with the author, with the people who build the condition of your experience. The Tenor Under the Atlantic is an old work, but it has an advantage that it's, um, it presents many aspects of what I'm talking about. So that was in 1995 uh, in the Pompidou Center and in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Montreal. And so what I proposed at that time was to create the possibility of meeting people by digging. You understand, Paris and Montreal are both sides of the Atlantic. So you can swim or you dig. And so this project was about digging, about digging a specific material. I will talk about that. So you see, uh, at the top was in Montreal. And in the bottom, you see the people waiting for their turn to interact and to dig in order to meet. So if you have to dig, it's because there is an obstacle. And in the virtual world, the obstacle is not material. It's a virtual obstacle. It's an unmaterial obstacle. And here the obstacle is a cultural obstacle. Cultural. The, what creates a distance between two people is culture first. It's not about any material. At this time, it was already, of course, possible to do video conferencing. And you have in real time people in front of you. But you don't see this obstacle. You don't feel it immediately. You just understand when you understand that you don't understand each other. And then you understand that this is a cultural obstacle. This is people digging. They actually dug a material that was made of images from the cultural past of France and Canada. And you dig a lot, you create big caves like that, but at the beginning you have nothing. And so these caves are like uh, uh, the remains of the memory, of the memory of the experience of digging. When you're digging, you can talk with the other on the other side, and the sound of the voice gives you the direction where to go in order to meet. Uh, actually, I'm pretty embarrassed because with this thing, I have the feeling that I'm selling you some soap or I don't know what. Uh, okay, it's an interesting feeling. Uh, well, we'll try another time. So, if you dig a lot, you, you end up meeting the people on the other side. And after five days of digging, they finally met. And the video floating in the space allowed them to see each other. It took five days when the video conferencing would have allowed them to meet immediately. What you missed, because I was talking at the same time, otherwise you would have understood the French, they said, Hi, Matthew, I can see you in Montreal. And the other one, Matthew, replied, Oh, I see you. You're dressed in red with a white color. So that's a very important point. You see, after five days, you know, people used to come to, uh, to both museums one or two hours every day, and very often they came all the days until the first meeting. And the message they had to transmit, to convey, was, I see you, you're dressed in red with a white color. So we are not talking about the communication highways. We are not talking about... Uh, the power of technology that allows you to be immediately in touch with everybody in the world. We are talking about what people are looking for when they are building a space where they meet other people they don't know. Why do they want to do that? Just to have this emotion. Just to have this, to have this emotion, I've done it, we see each other, and it's enough. It's enough for two things. 
First of all, if you're aware of uh, Alfred Hitchcock movies and what the discussion he had uh, uh, with um, Truffaut, with François Truffaut, Hitchcock explained what is a MacGuffin. How many of you know what is a MacGuffin? One. It's not enough. A MacGuffin. Two, three. Better. More. <laughs> no? Four. Okay. The MacGuffin is a very interesting concept. Alfred Hitchcock expli explained that uh, in the movie he did called A Lady Vanishes, everybody is trying to find this woman who vanished in the train, and this woman is supposed to have a very important message to transmit. And everybody is running all the, all the movie trying to find her. Does she exist? Did, did she really vanish? Somebody uh, probably uh, uh, wrapped her? Uh, we don't know. At the end of the movie, we find her. She arrived in London, and she is now playing the message on the keyboard of the piano. Five notes. Everybody has been running all the movie to find five notes. And of course, nobody cares about what does it mean. Nobody cares about what was this message that I want to know. No. It's not about that. It's about the experience of finding the person we're running after. So what Hitchcock called a MacGuffin is this. Here, the MacGuffin is people are just digging and they have to find each other. So that's an interesting moment. And in theory of communication, this is what we call the fatic dimension of communication. And the fatic is to establish the contact and to maintain the contact. This is what happens when all on the phone you say, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. And you, can you hear me? Yeah. Are you still here? Are you listening? All these things that are not about the specific content are typical, what we call the fatigue dimension of communication. And if you are just a bit careful about what's going on on social networks and uh, on the internet and uh, all these things, you discover that 95% of the communication it's just this fatigue dimension. I'm in touch with people. I maintain the contact. They know I exist. It's about existing. It's about being part of this thing that builds your state of mind. You're not alone. And this intensity, this very specific intensity, is, uh, is an, uh, of course, an important phenomenon. So... Why I explain all this uh, without telling how it's made? I'm not talking about technology. I don't say how it's made. It was a crazy thing, of course. But I don't tell you how it's made. I just tell you that this thing was not to make a demonstration that, about what we can do with virtual reality in terms of communication, intercontinental communication. It's more about what is our social experience of meeting what we could find in the fact to reverse the process of going faster. What, how we introduce intensity in the experience by uh, actually giving more time to the thing. If it takes five days, the intensity is higher than if it takes five minutes. That's a point that we shouldn't forget. And so at this time, I was just trying to explain that I was working on architecture of communication creating a specific architecture for communication. And this architecture is actually creating a specific relation between people, like the actual architecture made of stones and mortar, as actually, uh, actually organizing the way we move, organizing the way we meet people, organizing the social life. So the impact of architecture is a very good model to understand the impact of virtual reality. And uh, this is uh, what I try to, to do with this work. So in a way, the, the space built by the experience of digging and by the experience of meeting people is a space that is just our footprint in information, our footprint in, uh, in this uh, world, the cultural world made of images. 
two years ago, I did a new tunnel that was called, called uh, Tunnels Around the World. And so it was part of different uh, events. And in Seoul, in San Jose, California, in Montreal, and in Hong Kong, uh, uh, Creative Media Center, we had people digging in another way inside a picture of the art history. Actually, uh, unfortunately, I had mostly pictures from French museums because they gave me all the collection of photos. So I had something like 30,000, 300,000, sorry, 300,000 pictures they were digging in. And so, in very different contexts, uh, they uh, could uh, dig just by making holes if they go forward. And so what I want to show you is what happens if I ask some of my students at the School of Creative Media just to interact with the work, because I didn't know, I didn't tell them what it was. I just told them, sorry, I have to make a video. Can you, do you accept to interact with it? So if they, if they decide to go where, to uh, one of the circles, uh, they go to the museum and they can talk to the people in the, in the other museum. So that there is a dialogue they can build with other people if they are uh, just awake at the time. As you can see, there are five interacting, but I never told them they can, can interact at five. Actually, the system is detecting only one person. So, uh, why does it work? That's uh, an important point. I told them nothing about uh, the interaction. It's just I have the feeling that something is happening because they are doing something. And uh, there is something happening that is very simple. The system detects only one thing. is the distance from the screen. So it's very easy to see that uh, if you move, there is something happening. And then when people do that, they come closer. But if they do that, they are not so close. And then if they do that, uh, you have a motion like that. I didn't plan this. This was not expected. This was virtually in the, in the way I designed the, the interaction, but this was not in my original intention. But the good thing is that we really enjoyed it. And something happened because the system gave them the impression that they really exist. Yeah, they say, I love you in Korean. Uh, of course, it was not really intended to, uh, to create some uh, kind of uh, uh, Luna Park uh, uh, attraction. Uh, the system is analyzing the behavior and decide of the content you will discover thanks to that. Yes? Скажите, как вы будете отвечать на вопросы, заданные на русском языке? Oh, sorry, I need, I need uh, some... How old, sorry? I, I, I've been... It has been cut. Oh, there is... Maybe I don't use it properly. You know, I don't believe in technology, so don't trust it. Yeah, you see, there is a... I'm sorry. Maybe somebody can translate your... He was asking how uh, are you going to uh, answer the questions in Russia. <laughs> so the uh, question was... I, I see you have something in the ear, and so I can... I guess somebody will translate the question. 
Когда человек осваивает какое-то пространство, ну, например, ребенок осваивает реальное пространство, он постепенно обнаруживает некие закономерности, скажем, связь между усилиями мышц ноги и приближением к предмету. Или когда мы осваиваем пространство монитора, мы устанавливаем связь между движением руки, скажем, вниз и движением курсора вверх. А вот в фильме, который я увидел, было некое пространство, реагирующее на жесты людей. Но никак не удавалось найти закономерность между тем или иным жестом и тем, что происходит в этом пространстве. Просто случайным образом менялись картинки. Я что-то не увидел в этом, или только это и было задумано? Случайная смена картинок. Окей. Okay. Um, I understand the question. Yeah, I have to explain more things about this. Um, actually, this work is more about some things that existed already in the first tunnel, but it was very primitive. You know, when you dig inside the image in the, in the first uh, tunnel, the organization of the content depends on the interest you express for what you see. So there is a kind of a dynamic uh, organization, and at the beginning, the world is empty, and new pictures come according to how you are interested by the previous one. So here, it's a very elaborated uh, form of the same thing called ergonomy. It's a software that is based on uh, what we perceive of your interest in order to give you something closer to what you could desire if you have no idea about what is in the database. Now, this thing said, obviously, they don't really care about the content here on the video because they are more just enjoying the interaction. The thing is, they were in, in a very specific situation because they had a camera. So they wanted to be as good as possible in front of the camera. And so they were trying to express with their body the fact that they feel that there is something happening when they do something. So the interaction is very simple. Uh, there is a circle in the ground. If you don't move, the images stop, and you can see that. If you go forward, you slowly change the thing, and then it goes faster and faster. You go backward, you can come back to the previous one because you want to see it. And so it's something to discover a content you don't know. And this is automatically organized to, uh, according to how people behave. So that's is uh, an experiment and a research that has been made out of a work done 20 years before. And this is, uh, I think, the interesting thing of it. Yes. Можно ли вас так понять, что вот эти студенты, они вели себя немножко непоказательным образом? Behaving, not showing off, but a little bit artificially to show а, some interest. But in fact, in the software, вещь, uh, there was a certain thing that uh, person demonstrates different micro gestures uh, to, towards the picture, Pro demonstrates certain degree of interest. The software catches the intensity of the gestures and according to its own criteria starts to represent present more and more pictures that could be of interest for such a person, uh, relying on that feedback, on the intensity of the micro gestures uh, from the visitor. Okay, sometimes the, the communication is cut. I did, I did my best, but uh, I think I get, I get your point. Um, yeah. The system is made for, uh, to be sure that people will easily interact without learning anything, without uh, watching uh, uh, a manual. They don't have to see how it works. They just, they just do it. Uh, actually, in different exhibition places, they never did that. They never behaved like that. I was interested because they used it in an extreme way. And 
this is something common in different works I did, uh, where I play with different levels of understanding. The first one is to create a, a kind of a, a exciting experience, and even if people don't understand immediately the content. The second one is you see other people interacting, and then you start understanding, oh, there is something happening. Maybe I didn't do it uh, the, the right way. Anyway, I enjoyed it. But now I can see there is something, there is something happening. And so you can, uh, you can go deeper inside the work. You will understand better what I say uh, in the next works. Yes, you wanted to say something. Do I need a... Добрый день. Вы, извините, обычное произведение искусства подразумевает некоторый смысл. То есть вот перекликаясь с первым самым вопросом. So we try to understand some scene, some rule, some story, what the artists want to tell us. So some sense in the story. But in your work, I think uh, it makes pieces of uh, art senseless. It's just a reference to certain activities that in fact senseless. No sense in them. It's a bit uh, cut. But okay, I can say, I think to, to reply this question, I think I need to show you more works you will understand. But one of the ideas is that the, the quality of the narrative is not coming from something that is built as a linear story. It's something that comes from your own experience. So this thing is talking to you. Of course, it's difficult always to understand it if you're not interacting. But if you interact, you understand that this thing is trying to talk to you. The dialogue is at a level of complexity where you can enjoy it as a gestural level if you want, but you can also enjoy it in terms of content. And I can tell you some people discovered amazing things I didn't know it was in the database. And even the people uh, from the French Museum didn't know they had that in their collection. Just because it was aimed to be met and found by them. This is a kind of serendipity project process for those who are familiar with serendipity. It's not, it has nothing to do with randomization, uh, which is totally meaningless. It has to do with the fact that you find things because you put yourself in the situation of finding, finding them. And it's a very, uh, it's a, it's a very uh, seen, uh, a very subtle way to understand that the virtual world can be built in a way that something becomes possible there, become possible for you. And this is why I'm talking about existing. But you, you will see with other works, it becomes more understandable. This one is a recent one, but in between there are many things. So um, maybe I try to show you more works. Oh. So what I created with the tunnel was a situation, a specific situation where you experience a specific relation with people. And then you act or you don't act. World Skin was in 97. In 97, uh, I proposed this uh, cave uh, VR, virtual reality installation. So what we call a cave is just a cubic uh, space where you can experience virtual reality. You are totally surrounded by image. So the, 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 the video is very bad, but this is really from that time. So you see you're actually experiencing a world made of pictures of the Second World War and the Bosnia War. And you have photo cameras. You have a group of people with photo cameras. And they are like tourists. And they are making a photo safari in the land of war. And when they make pictures, when they take pictures, when they take, is removed from the scene and is printed out. Becomes real. Uh, we need some sound on this. Uh, can we have uh, the sound a bit louder? Please. So the sound, at the beginning, the sound of the photo camera is a, sound, a camera trigger. Then it becomes like a gun sound. So the situation you are in looks very innocent at the beginning because you're just making photo. And then you perceive that you are actually erasing the, you are erasing the facts. You are converting the world in a world of ghosts. 
but you can you can leave with uh, take away the, the printing and uh, keep it for you so it's a real photo camera and you're really taking photos and you are really erasing the traces it's called world skin can make it in a, it's called world skin and people are erasing the skin of the world and at the same time creating they are creating a trace a memory they will keep and they are erasing the collective memory of the thing that was a pretty uh, paradoxical uh, situation because at this time in 97 people expecting expected virtual reality to be a nice demonstration of how you can move uh, in nice colors and big volumes in the space and not to think about what is memory and uh, what does it mean to uh, to share or to fight to uh, get the memory people won't have because if you don't take the photo before somebody else will take it it's too late it's not anymore in the film so you see different situations. This is a kind of a six-sided cube, cube, and uh, I presented also on a wide screens, and um, and it works if if it takes all the field of view. So this is a, typically what I call a situation in art. This is you're in a certain context, and your behavior is modified by the situation. And there are some people I, I remember an artist, uh, Masaki Fujiata who succeeded in convincing people around him to make no photo. During half an hour, he stay in this space, moving inside, not taking one photo. And imagine the relation between people, how you can convince people not to make photo. And when they have photo camera and they can, and some just play fighting with them in order to erase everything without understanding what they are doing. This is... This is what war is about. You know, when people are not ready for that, and then suddenly we tell them, oh, you know what you believe in, like uh, protect people's life, be careful with others, and so on. No, it's not, it's not valid anymore. Oh, you don't have a microphone? Uh, is it is it possible to? В этом фильме видится некий обман. I see uh, that you deceive, that you defraud the participants of this show, because uh, uh, in the habits of the people, uh, they know that when they take a picture, they keep it as a memory. But here. The mechanism is totally different. Taking pictures, they destroy all these traces. But as people cannot change their habits uh, in one minute, for them, taking picture by inertia means keeping as a memory. So, and here it's interpreted like erasing, like forgetting. You're totally right. You're totally right. It's about deception. This is... Uh, this is one of the basics of the narrative. Of course, people would like, uh, uh, would like you to give them exactly what they want. But they, are not, they don't keep the memory uh, of what is just immediate satisfaction. They are uh, more often uh, waiting for something else. And I consider that the role of the artist is to provoke this deception. But, of course, can we see that people are really... Uh, sad about uh, the fact that they have been doing that, I can tell you, emotionally speaking, this is pretty strong. I mean, I can tell you the experience of people getting out of the cave or getting out of the uh, world skin. And uh, for them, they have their, and I think they have most of the time the feeling that something happened to them that is more important than just to make photos of photos. Something else is happening, and this is what we call, even many, many art critics, and not art critics, more scientists talking uh, writing about art, have been working on this concept of deception in art, and how uh, it's, 
exactly the opposite of what tried to do the mainstream cinema. We tried to bring a form of satisfaction. A short deception and then a strong satisfaction. They will divorce and then they get married again. Great. And they kiss each other and they have a lot of babies. That's the usual scenario. And I think the, the purpose of our artworks is to do something different enough with some time pretty provocative approach that makes you think about what you're doing. So the critical dimension of this experience, of course, is an important component of it. But you're totally right. There is a deception. Let's say there is a surprise and their, uh, their usual way of thinking is, in a way, uh, taken uh, in, in, a, in the counter way that is pretty uh, different of their usual expectation. This is how strong things happen. Something suddenly is there that you don't expect. And you expect it, of course, as an artist, to be stronger or more interesting by this way and to say something else. So, the, of course, the narrative in art can be of a different, very different kind of um, what it can be in a novel, what it can be in cinema. You know that. I'm not telling you something new. Uh, but this narrative, when you're talking about creating an experience and creating a world where people can have an experience, you're dealing with something you don't know, is how they will behave. And so how you create a world of rules that will trigger behaviors that will help people to, uh, to just ask questions, to, they will, that will interrogate people in a way that they get out of that with the, with the feeling to have experienced something uh, special. That's, that was uh, the intention here. Okay, so now, yeah, you just see a group of people. It's important in this, uh, in this work is it's a group work. So yeah, you, need, you need a group of people to be together because then the relation between people uh, is different and some people are sometimes at the beginning trying to compete. Sometimes, the young one. And then they understand there is something else happening. And this something else is stronger. I can give you another key. This was presented in, in Linz, in Austria. This was commissioned by the Arts Electronica Center. And of course, as some of you know that Linz was a city of Hitler. And a, a city probably where they did uh, a lot of effort to forget and to erase memory. So the imagine pictures of this in the front page of the most important uh, newspaper in Austria, and you understand that the impact is stronger than we can think. Suddenly people consider that there's something happening about erasing the memory about pictures of the Second World War. So that's the situation, the context is very important. You do works for a certain context. Then they, become, they can become a reference and you can show it in other contexts. But the context is why you decide to put this kind of content this way at a certain moment in certain location. So that was just the basement of the Ars Electronica Center. So the very center of uh, the city. And, um, and this was... Uh, I think this is, this is one of the most mentioned works in virtual reality made by artists. So uh, it's interesting to wonder why. why? So this is a kind of photo people, people uh, take away. So uh, now a very different work made... Uh, later, it was in 2011. So I, I don't fo I'm not following the chronology, I'm just following the, the, the concept. The concept of being inside or not. This was an exhibition in Athens. Uh, yeah, this is a video. So it was an exhibition about ecology and architecture. And the video were presented inside uh, on the ground. And if you walk inside, 
So here I recorded just a pass with the camera. If you work over the, the videos, you have an impact, immediate impact on the video. You create a distortion. Always the same. At the beginning, you can enjoy the fact that you create this distortion. Then, you want to see the videos. So you get outside. This is a two times uh, important times in the experience of, uh, of it. So in between, you have, you have these kind of bubbles on the ground. It's like cells, and these cells are actually merging. If you meet somebody else, you become one. So this was the osmosis uh, part of the work. So you see, it's a, it's a meta work. It's a work uh, which in a way covers all the works that were presented here. It's a kind of, also a kind of architecture, but there is no architecture. It's more about your experience of discovering the content and how you can create a specific meaning uh, through this uh, experience. Yeah. In fact, I have a feeling that there is, let's say, a good video game. I'm here, I'm here. There is a very good video game with a digging in. You look into the screen, you got uh, deeper, you feel yourself in the safe uh, space and you start acting. And I have an impression that when there is a very powerful uh, video line, uh, you have the same impression, just like you are inside that video game. I mean, those people who were in the screen, that they got into that space, particular space, very well made, uh, that space of that game, and they start existing there. So I want to understand where is the borderline for you, maybe. Where is for you the borderline between art and where is very good video line or like a video game? And I want to understand what are you searching for? What are you looking for? What are you trying to dig up to? Thank you. Thank you. Спасибо. <laughs> uh, yeah, the question of video game is very interesting. Why do people think that when, when there is a kind of interaction, it's a game? It's just because the game is exactly what we experience in life when we want to be, when we are confronted to uh, other and to the world as well. The game is a way to learn. It's a, it's a way to uh, discover our limits. But the difference between a video game and an artwork is that in the artwork you cannot win. There is no winner. There is no loser. It's not about that. It's more, my reference is not video game. My reference is dialogue. In a dialogue, you say something, then somebody asks you questions, you try to answer, and you try to bring other arguments. And maybe you have other arguments, you will say, no, I disagree, this is really a video game. And then this is dialogue. I don't know if at the end of the dialogue there is a winner. For me, it's pretty successful when both of us have the feeling to know something more at the end of the experience. So I'm more talking about that. This is different shapes of dialogues. No winner. I mean, no loser. Yes? You, you have a question? No. So, no. I saw somebody wanted to ask a question. Okay. Yeah. Good evening. Can you tell me? Uh, do you write software yourself for your installation, or maybe there is your team of IT guys who do it for you? Thank you. So in the 80s, I started doing some software uh, programming myself. I spent uh, night and days on that. 
I was not very good because I never learned. And then I understood something very important. That when you start writing a software, you want it to be better and better and better. And you spend an infinite time on it. When you have written one million lines of code, of code you're pretty happy with your thing. You cannot say, no, I won't use it because this is not what I want to say. So I decided at this time that I will work with the people good for that. You know, the best one. Honestly, I had very good people working with me. I had some of the best in the world in the, at the end of the 80s, beginning of the, 20, uh, the, uh, the 90s. I had very high-level people working on this. And uh, I was very happy to do that. You know, it's like when you make, when you make a movie... You can, of course, you are a director, but you can take the camera if you want. This is exactly what the Nouvelle Vague did, uh, the, and the director from the Nouvelle Vague. And you can take the camera, you can do it. You can also play an actor. This happens sometimes. And you see the director being an actor. And you can maybe make the music. And some good director did that as well. They made the music of the movie. And you can do the editing, because, of course, you learn how to do it. And you can do everything. But if you, if you have some kind of ambition in your project and you know you're not the best to do every part of it, you try to find the best people to do it. So what I did, I tried to... I had mostly at the beginning, I was lucky because the world was smaller. Yeah, you don't feel it, but it was smaller. And, and so at this time, some people came to me and told me, um, oh, yes, I would like to do something with you. That was good. I was lucky. Now it's not anymore like that because there are plenty of people doing uh, software development and plenty of people needing these kind of skills. And so they don't have problem to express their creativity. And, and it's, not, it's not that easy. But usually, usually um, I, I had a team during 15 years. And um, so I could do many works I did. Uh, and then now, according to the... I still have a team. Two teams, even. But it's not as big as it used to be. Uh, but now I build the team around what I have to do. And even, even uh, an engineer, uh, a software engineer, uh, there are some very good in doing something, and some are very good in doing something else. So it depends on what I want to do. So it's more about a project. I'm more developing a project, and I try to create a team around it. That's, that's the way I work. So I have, I have nothing against people doing their own software. But if you look carefully to what they do, they do things pretty similar all their life because they try to improve their tool and then they become stuck to their tool. But now we are at a time when the tool you have done 10 years ago, you have plenty of people who did a better one. And so you're just, should I use, still use my tool? When there are some very good commercial tools that do that very well, and now there are more and more very good tools that are available. At this time, we had to develop everything from scratch. No tunnel software existing. No real-time 3D graphics. No meeting, intercontinental meeting existing. No specialized sound. No automatic uh, film editing that was introduced in the same project. No video inside 3D. So this has to be done with people really how to do knowing how to do it. I'm coming from contemporary art. I'm not, I'm not coming from uh, engineering and technology. You know, I discovered that just because I wanted to do something with that. It's not, it's not my field. I'm not born with that. You know, the first computer I used was I was 30 years old, not before. One more question. I would like to go back to that movie that you shown us before. There is a device, a musical device. And when the person put a hand into that device, uh, certain musical tone sounds. If the person starts moving the hand, uh, the intensity and uh, the frequency of the tone can be changed. And experimenting this way, you can play a melody of a particular song. And this is a significant result. So you may learn how to play this device as a musical instrument. 
And in your movie, when uh, visitors step on the floor and it leads to certain deformation, can we have similar result or it's just uh, random deformation? Thank you. So this is a very important point. Uh, we have been talking about the relation between uh, interactive artworks and video games. That's one point. There is another one, which is the difference between an artwork and a musical instrument. The instrument is something you use to, pre to produce a specific content. So you're totally free. There is no intention behind the, the instrument, like a piano, for example. It's very clever to conceive a piano. It's fantastic to have done that, to have changed the way people make music for the last centuries. That's really great. But it's a music instrument. The piano doesn't make the music by itself. So here, I'm not expecting the people to use it as an instrument. I expect them just to exist in the work and to do whatever they want to do. And actually, they very quickly understand what's going on because there is a real logic in the way it moves. The, the, the green bubbles work around them, merge together. This is very simple. They follow them. The, and the, in the image, they are moving on. The distortion is related to their apparent gravity, and they are attracting the image to them. So they, have a, they create a, a space-time distortion that is pretty close to what a particle would have, the impact a particle would have on the physical world around us. So this is a kind of relativity. And I'm working also on uh, adapting reactivity to the uh, individual experience. And this is something you immediately notice when you experience it. That's why it's always embarrassing to show video about uh, interactive works. Because you have to explain for hours how it works and what can be the feeling of people when they experience it. Honestly, I'm not sure I can convince you that there is something happening that they feel as positive. But I want at a more theoretical level, to make a difference, to point the difference between an artwork and a music instrument. And you, you can see in many works, there is a real ambiguity. And there are some very good works that are, honestly, pretty good instruments, but not necessarily good artworks. But they can be good instruments, and it's positive as well. So we need people doing good instruments, and we love that. Did I reply to your, to your question? Okay, thank you. So, what I see, what I see is what you get. So, you've seen on different works that uh, I try to take into consideration what people look like, look at. And so, I did a series of works where people look at things like artworks in a uh, art impact work I did in uh, 2000 in the Pompidou Center. And, and I did a series of works where when people look at something, they actually create the content that way. Cosmopolis was in 2005. Uh, it's an it's a installation that has been presented in four cities, Shanghai, Chongqing, Chengdu, and Beijing. It was for the French here in China. And uh, the thing is that uh, I had to uh, create telescopes. I can tell you, I haven't done the steel thing. I haven't done the software. I haven't done the music. And I just conceived it and directed it. So this is a telescope where you can see a photo panorama from 12 different cities around the world. So... Uh, yeah, you, you understand, you can zoom and so on. So that's uh, the project. The project was to create 12 screens that create a big panorama and with 12 telescopes here. And for each telescope, you have a plasma screen to see what people are looking at. This is a kind of panorama that was presented. It was about uh, urban development. It was about uh, city planning and how cities evolve in time according to social concerns and, uh, and political uh, vision. And so the photos were coming from 12 different cities. There were uh, Sao Paulo, Chicago, Soweto, Cairo, 
not only O, Barcelona, uh, Paris, Berlin, and uh, four cities, uh, five cities in Asia, uh, that, because this was the different places where the exhibition was going, so Chengdu, Chongqing, uh, Beijing, uh, Shanghai, and uh, Hong Kong. So this was a, at the human level. It was important not, not to see some kind of touristic uh, panorama. This is in Shanghai. And so this was related during these uh, different works about what I call the collective retinal memory. When people look at something, what they look at is painted out on the panorama. So it becomes like an airbrush painting. But if you have 12 people looking at 12 different cities, the cities will be mixed. This was just a project. So you understand it becomes a city made of different cities. As we had six panoramas for each city, uh, it was something like, or five panoramas, it was something like 60 different panoramas. And so this is a work done before he went to, uh, to Shanghai. And so you see, everything is made in a way that the, the audience will be part of the set. They become part of the work. I consider very often that the visitor is, uh, becomes part of the work at the time it activates it. And so you see the, the kind of impact you, you get. And so that's the, that's the work. Uh, it's a, it was in a, um, in a Zeppelin um, warehouse in a, close to Paris. And you see the different telescopes and uh, you see the people uh, interacting with it. So the light is on them. So you can see, uh, you can see them when you're in the middle. And so this was presented in Science Museum because it was 25 meters diameter. It was very difficult to find a place. And the only place we found in Shanghai was this uh, 2,000 square meter uh, space in the uh, Science Museum. And so you had people in the middle watching the panorama and some other people uh, watching the telescopes. So this, uh, it was more than 10,000 people every day in Shanghai. But that was what I was commissioned for. So they, this is why the telescope looks sturdy like that. It's because uh, I was told, oh, a lot of people will come, so you have to do something that can resist in terms of interaction. And the exhibition was one month in each city, so that was pretty challenging. There is a video online where you see the installation of that and the building of it, but uh, it would be too long. So what I really appreciated in, uh, in China is... Uh, and this is probably why I'm now in Hong Kong, is uh, people come in family. They don't, it's not like the classical contemporary art exhibition where you just uh, go and you say, okay, I see that again. No, it's that uh, they come with the very young and, uh, and the elderly and, uh, and, and, and they know how to make openings. So that's, uh, that's the opening. Because uh, this exhibition was the opening of the museum, Three Gorge Museum in Chongqing. Uh, so, uh, so it's a, also the opening of the museum, of course, not only the opening of the exhibition. Um, so th this family things and friends things is really, it's really great. So it depends, uh, you, you can choose your friends also. Uh, and you see people are really part of the work. That's very important. We are talking about the city, we are not talking about uh, stones and concrete. So they come with their friends. So when I say that I work with virtuality, I work with something I don't know is how people will behave. But I create a situation in a way that they will be able to produce something that is meaningful for the whole work. That's that, the, the challenging part. And this is the resulting, one of the samples of the experience of watching. And you see how it's mixed. It's not really meaningful in itself. It's more the experience of saying, we share something that has never been shared. We share what you, we look at when we look at the city. And this is something that has never been done. I'm not trying to compete and being the first doing something. I mean, we still don't know what people look at when they move in a city. We don't know that. 
because they cannot share it. Of course, they could, but I think nobody really tried to know. Maybe they're, they're right not to try. I don't know. So that's what I, how I planned the, the path of people. I thought, okay, they will come from outside, and they will go in the center because I think, okay, everything is happening in the center. And then in the center, they see other people interacting with the telescope. So, so they go outside, they try one city, another city, and then they go inside because the sound tells them there is something else happening. And, of course, it was also another kind of content that was uh, deciphering, uh, decoding of the city by people from the different cities. And uh, with videos and uh, interviews and so on. So let's come to fusion because I'm already long. What time is it? <laughs> Do you know? Okay. So it's already eight. Okay. I, I told you I will say things about fusion. So. Yes, I should. You, you have seen that in many of my works, I ask people to become part of the fiction. In, in World Skiing, I ask them to enter the fiction of the landscape and so on. And they become, them, physically speaking, real people inside the fiction, inside their representation. And so it's a, it's a form of fusion, of fiction, of fiction and reality. There is a fusion of them, and then people behave in a way that is pretty close to what they would experience in the real world, in their relation with the world. Cosmetics is what you do with fusion when you're trying just to hide the surface of things, when you're just trying to make the world more acceptable when it's not. But this risk, because this is a risk, uh, this is what the situation is used to call the society of the spectacle. Of course, you heard about that. This is very, uh, very trendy nowadays to talk about that. But this was the origin of, uh, of uh, my work on this field, was to try to see how to work on fusion without creating something that is just hiding reality by creating a kind of entertaining fiction. You can have a very good example of what I call cosmetics. This is it. You have an interesting piece of architecture, and then you ask artists you know, to come and do something funny, colorful, and you give them bread and circus. You give them what, you, what they need not to be uh, not to be disappointed by life and not to protest and not to do something that could be uh, in opposition with, uh, the, with the power. So you have to give eye candies, something delightful, something nice, something colorful, life sweeteners. A good example of that, I'm not talking about an artwork, I'm talking about reality. This was presented during the G8 summit in Ireland. What you see, maybe you don't see it, is photographs stuck on the shop to pretend that this empty shop is actually full of goods. Another example, this wonderful restaurant full of people, this marvelous shop, is actually gives a nice vision of the city where everything is perfect. Oh, here it was a bit difficult. Honestly, cosmetics have limits. But I guess you get the point. This is exactly what most of the time artists are, ask when they have to do something in cities. Urban art is very challenging. So what I'm trying to do and what I respect in, in art in the public space is what I call critical fusion. 
is to introduce fiction in reality in a way that it makes it more understandable. Not to hide reality, but to help, to help decoding it. So it's a form of reality hacking. So I, I started to, you know, I'm not, I'm not creating theories and then I work. I do both at the same time. That's, I think, a, a usual process. So in 2002, uh, even in 2000, I started to think about a project that was uh, inspired by the Panopticon, you know, Ben Tam thing. And this, watch out, was a work that was done the first time made for uh, Seoul, at Center Abbey in Seoul. So I just said, okay, let's put boxes like that in the city, just to see what's going on. And I don't know why, but I was really convinced that because of the whole people would look, like, look inside the box. And inside the box was a screen where it was written, send a warning message to the world. So people could use their, uh, do an, uh, texting and send a message like save the whales and, uh, and don't pollute and, uh, and all the things that the media are telling us to, to send as a positive message. So you see, it's a very politically correct work. So people look inside the work, inside the, uh, the box, and actually they really did it. So they was happy. Uh, they made it gray instead of black uh, because they thought, okay, we have a lot of signs in the street and, uh, uh, that are black and, and uh, yellow, so that means don't come. I say, okay. And so when people look inside, they see all the message sent, and sometimes it's interesting, but very often it's what we already know. What they don't see immediately is that when they look inside the box, their eye is watching the world. So you have four, four LED in the box, so they look like that. What that? And obviously they don't find the world very exciting because they, they go like that saying, yeah, nothing. And so what happens here is a kind of a situation that is the opposite of what people think about the panopticon about the idea that our, our society is made uh, to control everybody by uh, putting camera everywhere to know everything. This is saying something slightly different. It's to say we are all big brother. We want to know everything about everybody. We want to uh, see the life of stars, but also the neighbors. We want, we want it. We want the world. We are making the world we live in. That's about this form of responsibility. And so the box in the, in the gallery uh, allowed people to get inside and to see the different cameras in the different boxes in the street. And so it's a bit like the Plato's cave, you know? You see the blurry world with shadows moving, and sometimes there is an eye that becomes sharp, and, and you see this eye watching at you, and obviously it doesn't consider this is very interesting. So this is another deceptive work because the fact that people are not interested by what is written when we do tell them, send a warning message to the world, is of course a way to say that what we see, what we hear, is maybe not the real thing. The real thing is about how we are built, how we are built to consider that we should know everything about everything and about everybody. That we want this society where we see a whole uh, total transparency, transparency, even if uh, we have no more uh, surprise about it. Another work in the, in the same idea, but a very pretty different, was New Horizon. It was in Shanghai in 2000, uh, 2008. And so it's a street installation. This is a, so in the street, I was invited to to make a work for the street, and I say, okay, let's do that. So it's a big avenue and Pudong that is uh, uh, the new part of, uh, of Shanghai, and I put what I call ID wands. And so, same thing, I, I thought, of course, that people would look inside and what they did. So I've been lucky. You have, I don't know if you do this kind of project, but you probably know that sometimes they don't do what you want. And so people look inside, and actually their identity is swallowed, 
and they are converted into a flash code. What I call ID codes. And so you see how they are converted, you know, it's playing half of the image as half of the available codes. And you see on the left side, middle of the screen, let's say, what I call the IDCD. And the IDCD is an ever-growing city. So they, people can get the, the flash code and they can use it. It's a real one. This is them. And here you see the city is paved with the flash codes, paved with the people, growing, growing, and the people become the buildings. It's a city made for people. But of course this is not happens in reality, because when I was doing, when I was making Cosmopolis, I've seen the people working on the buildings. They used to live in the third or the fifth basement of the building. And at the end, when, when it's done, they go back to the countryside. They never live in this city. This is not in the city for them. So, what, what I want to say, of course, one of the things I want to say in this kind of work is that we make city for people. Don't forget that. And these people making city should be part of the city. Otherwise, there is a, there is a problem. I'm trying, I will go faster with this. There's uh, yeah, many things to show you. Mechanics of Emotion is a series of works I started in, in 2005. And I started with a very simple concept, which is that actually uh, internet uh, would be the world nervous system. It's simple, it's a kind of cliche, but it's also a reality. If we consider that we are all nerve endings of a global body, we understand why we are providing information all over the world. When I say information, I mean signs, I mean gestures, I mean words, photos, everything, feelings. And, and all these things, we are feeding the beast, and the beast is a humankind. We are globally constituting a, a global body which is made of uh, seven billions of nerve endings, and we share emotions. So I started to work on a uh, world emotion mapping to create maps of, the, um, maps of the emotion and trying to quantify the human factor instead of uh, checking, uh, checking the evolution of the stock market. So this is made uh, very simply by putting together worlds of cities and and words of emotions and seeing what kind of, how many hits I get. So it's very simple. It's a bit more complex because actually I'm not interested by the result. I'm interested by the evolution of the result from one day to another. So if I have New York scared 1,200,055 and the day after I have 2.5% more, I think there is something happening. So I started with very poor things like that. And of course, we see very quickly that there are places in the world where there is no data. Like Africa, there is no so many data. We don't see. It's like a global body where you, can, you cannot feel some of the limbs. And then I decided, what if uh, this material, I mean the emotion of the world, I would try to make an object out of it? This is a reification process. I call these frozen feelings, like uh, dead emotions. And I made sculptures automatically with a digital carving tool. And so here you see on the left, China, Japan, on the right, North America, South America, and the Pacific Ocean in the middle. It's like a deflated globe where the emotions are actually creating the relief. And you see the digital carving tool is working like on a, on a vinyl record and recording in spiral, recording emotions like recording music. 
And I thought, okay, this is the emotion of the world. This is something very precious. So the first thing I did is to bring them to the temple. So I created a project called Sphere, and I presented, I projected on Balloon the map of fear, and in a church, I presented the thoughts and feelings like relics. So very precious things, but it was about terrified, scared, and so on. And 15 days after, I took, I took them from the temple, and I brought them to the merchant. So I created an emotional market where I converted an art gallery at the fifth floor here into, into a luxury shop where I presented the same frozen feelings like luxury products so people could finally buy the emotion of the world. So you see projection of the maps of the emotion and then you see the, uh, the objects. And with different materials, some of them made handmade by uh, Chinese and some of them made of aluminium, plated, gold-plated aluminium. So emotion stock, of course, in the same exhibition, we had uh, the, the course of uh, uh, the, the stock market of the emotion with uh, insecure, ecstatic, and alone. And we could see for the 3,200 cities what is the, uh, the level of it. And so what is interesting is, is the emotion convertible? So the emotion vending machine was a good way to check if we can convert emotion into money. So you see the, the machine, and you see you can select three emotions, and you get, you get a musical uh, composition made of uh, the mixing a cocktail, uh, mixing three emotions, and you can take it away with uh, your uh, USB stick. Still moving is a sculpture where I... I mixed three emotions, but it's a giant sculpture that was presented in the Grand Palais in Paris. And when you touch it, you reveal the data. And at the same time, you feel the emotion because the music is made of infrasound under 20 years. You cannot hear it, but you feel it in your body. And so it was pretty playful, as you can see. And... Uh, and people were revealing by touching the emotion. Yeah, they touch a lot. Emotion forecast, of course, is a, a way to see what is the emotional state of the world today, tomorrow, and the day after tomorrow. So it's very important to know what will be the emotional state of the world. So this will presented, and uh, this has been presented in something like 12 cities around the world. So this was in Paris. I thought it was better for the postcard here. And uh, so people could see uh, what is the global feeling of the world. So you see that the aesthetics is based on one of my aesthetic reference, which is uh, Bloomberg TV, uh, which is uh, uh, probably the, the model of uh, quantifying the world. But it's more about money, and this one is about emotion. So you just uh, see a few seconds of uh, this. Uh, we can reduce a little bit. Now? Soon. Okay. Okay, I'm close to the end. <laughs> Sorry. So you see uh, emotion forecast. So it's pretty, pretty simple. Huh? Okay, I have to... Uh, Occupy Wall Street, so this was presented in New York and uh, close to uh, Wall Street, where I presented side by side the, and the emotion of the cities where the Occupy movement was, was high and, uh, and the stock market of the financial stock. And I tried to compare what is going up, what is going down. And so this was on a screen in the street like that. This was in Seoul last year uh, on a big building in front of the main station in Seoul. And so this 100 meters by 100 meters, and people could uh, check 
uh, the, this comparison between the stock and, uh, and the emotion. And the music is the original sound I recorded at the same time. And this is a Salvation Army, which is singing because we are close to Christmas. And so, of course, reality is always stronger. We cannot chant that. So this is called Escape, Emotion Escape, you understood. Escape today. That was uh, the message. Emotion wins. Is, um, okay, it's not a good video. I should have uh, shown another video. Is what if the emotion of the world would be moved by the real winds? So I use the data from the real winds, and I take the emotion streams, and I try to see which part of the world is contaminated by the emotion of the other part. So this is actually uh, presently exhibited in, uh, in Shanghai. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there are other things, but it will be too much for today. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. Good evening once again. Could you tell me, as far as we see, your projects are pretty costly. Is it difficult to find money, financial support for the implementation of your projects? Thank you. Uh, you know, I, I try to say, um, yeah, you, you know, I, I've been teaching from uh, when I was 20. So uh, I try to say something to my students when they tell me, uh, can I do, uh, can I, uh, when you ask me to make a project, can I conceive something very big? And I say, you have no problem to find the money if your project deserves this money. So that's, that's the thing. So every time, of course, if I know there is no money, I try to see if there is a way to do it. If there is money, I try to do something for the money. So if you see, for example, an extreme project like uh, Cosmopolis, this was different. I had six months to make it. No, three months. And I say, do you have the budget? Or the, or the way I won't do it. It's too big. It's too far away. And they say, yeah, for this one, we have the budget. So in this case, it's easy. But it's not a way like that very often. It's, uh, people tell you, oh, I'm preparing an exhibition I want an event, and I would like you to do something. W what does it cost? And I say, I don't know. And then this is a permanent discussion. And you never do it for what it costs. You do it, you know, for example, for the, the tunnel, we had not even 10% of the budget to make it. Just try to put together the people that want to make it. And then you convince the other people. You, you need somebody to start. It's not like film production, you know. You need somebody to start, and you say, oh, I have a little bit of the money. I have some good friends that want, want to help. Uh, and uh, would, you, would you help? So some people provide the space, some people provide the, the equipment, some people provide... And then you put that together. It's a... It's a, at the same time you conceive and you produce, or you find producers that tell you, uh, okay, you have plenty of money, you want to do it? That's, of course, a dream story. Um, I'm here. No matter. It's a very general question to you as a guru. Why now in art we see more uh, active forms than passive forms, because uh, your projects, they are more interactive than simply spectacular. Why? Why does it happen? Um, it's a very good question. It's a very good question. Uh, I spend half of my time now to work on photos and to do what could be the minimalistic version of project. So what I didn't present to you is a project called The Dump, where you, I put all the projects I haven't done. So there are 200, 200, sorry, 207 projects that I ended in 2006. And then uh, I put them, and then some uh, curator invited artists to, uh, to, realize, uh, to realize them, and then some other, some, uh, some um, uh, Exhibition places ask me to realize some of them. Uh, but the real artistic project is the fact to put together a project I haven't done. So it's another way not to be very active. And so the, the most extreme thing I'm doing now in this way of being 
totally not active, I create what I call 30 videos. 30 video is, for example, the one you have seen about emotion wins. So emotion wins is on one screen like that, for example. And when you arrive in the exhibition and you say, so what that? You see a screen totally black and there is nothing on the screen. But if you stop talking, if you say nothing and you're just watching, the thing appears and comes to you. And when you say, oh, great, it goes away. So that's a, a way, to, I hope, to answer your question and to say, if you go under the level of the minimum of interaction, what can it be? It's attention. It's pure attention. And if you do something, the work shouldn't exist in this case. I mean, it makes sense for a certain kind of work. But, yes, I'm working on that direction, trying to see what can be the minimum of interaction you can do in an intera interactive work. And I say, nothing. Good evening. I would like to ask you about the opportunity to forecast the results of your social experiments, if I can call it like this, because they reminded me the experiments in the quantum physics, where a lot depends on the observer. And in your projects, one of the first that you showed, a lot depends on the feedback, on the reaction of the visitors, of the participants. So uh, how uh, the expectations from you have expectations, how they are comparable, how they are similar to when the people are involved? Yeah, that's, uh, of course, an important point. Uh, in the process of producing this kind of work, you cannot consider that your work uh, starts with the opening of the exhibition. Never. You put your work on, and then the audience come, and then you observe. According to that, you do the final fine-tuning in order to get exactly the quality of dialogue that you're expecting. So this thing is, you know, like the painter putting some color on the canvas and thinking, doesn't work, let me change it. Oh, okay, that's better. And then you improve it. I think in this kind of work, you do it just at the time the first visitors come and start to interact. And then you understand, okay, the rhythm is not good. Uh, they don't see uh, what they should see. There is a delay on this, doesn't work. And very tiny things like the facial expressions when you're dialoguing with people, you know, the very simple things become crucial and change totally the result. For example, the result on um, uh, Watch Out, I did it in 2004 for the uh, Olympic Games in Athens, and the delay was seven seconds between people watching and the display. Just because of that, it changed totally the nature of the work. Because people could look inside the box and then see themselves by waiting outside. And then they start another process that is more narcissistic. And it's not if this was not intended. But they did turn it in a very clever way, very exciting way. And then you have to accept what you cannot predict. So this is a risk you take by doing something, by uh, playing with virtuality. You know? it's, not, it's not always what you expect, but it can be better sometimes. Oh, there are two people. Yeah. Good evening. I have a question. In case of uh, photos making and in the case of the eye that was reflected on the big screen in the Watch Out project, in both cases, we, had, we deal with certain, you know, piece of lies. Because when people were taking pictures, uh, the image was erased, but it was not erased physically. Still, the image was somewhere in the memory of the hardware, or it was very similar picture. And the eye that we seen on the big screen in the project Watch Out, the eye which uh, looked uh, through the camera, uh, it was, uh, again, a certain piece of lies, because that eye was not uh, seeing anything. It was sort of deceive or defraud. So can we say it, that it's done just 
to see it just to see its certain effect, certain art, but uh, the question is whether others see it or not. Could it happen that this piece of lies will stay a piece of lies, you know? But it will not be rethought, reconsidered by the spectators, by the visitors. Okay. Uh, there, there are different points here. Uh, one of them is do you are you lying or do you believe in what you say? Pardon, what? Oh, I say, are you lying or do you believe in what you say? Uh, uh, am I lame? Lying. Because you say it's a piece of lie. Ah. Well, uh, I, uh, I suppose I believe in what I say. This is something about dialogue. When, you, when we say something in a dialogue, yeah. we say something. It doesn't mean that we believe 100% of what we say. We're just checking something. We are checking. So, watch out this kind of reality check. People discover something. They are in situation. But actually, they know it's an artwork. They know it's a dialogue not with this, but with the artist's intention. And so this is what they see. Of course, if I go and see a movie, I will say that they never jump from the sky, from the plane. Never they did that. They never crashed this beautiful car. They, this actor is not the name, the, the name of the actor is not the real name. I know this actor. Of course, it's a lie. This is what art is about. It's not about lying. It's about creating a situation where, where people will start accepting, you know, the suspension of disbelief. They start accepting something in order to be able to share. They create a kind of complicity. This complicity is not based on lies. When I say people erase the memory, I'm not telling them they erase the original picture. No. I'm just telling them they convert something they see in something they can take away. And they create a symbolic situation where the fact to do that helps them to think about something like erasing the trace the traces of the past and the memory of what happened. So, we can call it lie, but we can call it fiction, we can call it dialogue, we can call it complicity. But in case of film, uh, we are aware, we are aware of, uh, of what we're watching, this is a film. But what you're talking is, is a virtual reality. That is a reality, There's some kind of reality, not uh, some state of, uh, of watching. Like in film, like in picture, like Michelangelo's uh, assistant chapel, chapel, he, he uh, uh, deforms uh, the images on, uh, on the walls so they would appear uh, 3D while they are 2D. But this is not the reality. This is not the virtual reality. This is the reality per se. Yeah, uh, you know, I'm sorry. You, you, can, you cannot tell me that people getting inside world skin, surrounded by a screen where they have glasses to see in 3D the world around them. This world is made of flat photos, cutouts, and they understand there are photos in a landscape that is not really war. They know that. They have photo camera. They see that sound evolve. Don't tell me they believe it's reality. Of course they don't. And I think it's very important that people understand when they are in front of their facing fiction. Even, even the story of the, of the train in the La Ciota station, where people would have moved like that, everybody knows that it's fake. This, was, this never happened. So we are not talking about people that are actually misled by something that pretend to be something else, but... We have to keep in mind that there are very often in this kind of situation two times, two stages. One of them is 
you are outside and you see people interacting. You see what's going on. Then you go, it's your turn. This is exactly what happened in the cave because people stay to wait and they see what's going on. They see the situation. Then they participate. So these two levels, as a spectator and as a visitor, are really, uh, are really important in the process. So very often, you expect people to experience something and then to take some distance in the Brescian sense of the term and try to figure out the whole picture. So it's more about that. It, don't forget these two times. This is why I say it's very difficult watching a video just to understand what is the exact situation. It would take for each work, it would take two hours. So uh, try to, to uh, pack that together in a way that uh, I can transmit part, part of the message. And we have the last question here. Can you hear me? Me, yes. Oh, yes, I see you. Thank you very much for your presentation. It was impressive. Um, I didn't expect oh. it to be so impressive. So I think I will express the feelings of everybody here. So my question is about the um, social impact. Because what I felt watching the, the slides and the video um, is that your projects and yourself as a person have a um, very big potential to impact, uh, to influence the social situation in the cities where you show the, the projects uh, in the countries maybe. So uh, my question is, um, has there been any, uh, any example when your project um, had real influence not in terms of just people's minds and people's thoughts, but in terms of, you know, governmental. Uh, do, do people who rule cities and countries pay attention to what you do? Uh, like, like your project about the QR codes. Does the ruler of the city where you showed it un understood, understand that the city should be uh, made of people and for people? So that's the question. Okay. Uh, of course, it's an important question because uh, the artists always believe that uh, they will have a big impact and it's very difficult to measure. Actually, in my works, I know that I, I had more impact on artists than on... Uh, I mean, not only... Uh, yeah, I didn't present the things I did, like quarks and so on, but I, I know many people who decided to do the job they are doing because of what I presented. But... Uh, maybe one of the examples which is the most obvious of what you say is what I did for the Arc de Triomphe in Paris. Because I just used a process. I did a permanent exhibition about war and peace. And the process was very simple, and this is what I did for the QR code. So I tell the people what they want to hear at the beginning. So in China, I didn't say what it was about. I said, oh, yes, I will use QR codes, it will be in the street, and it will be 3D graphics on the screen, and they say, great. Then, now I tell you what it is about. Of course, many of them understood what it was about after. But if you say it before, of course, this would have never existed. Same thing on Seoul, on the building where there are traders working in, and when I show them things about a financial stock, they understood what it was just the day before, the night before when they tested for the last time, and I used whatever I could to make them not to cancel it. In the Arc de Triomphe, the interesting thing is that uh, the work is actually worse because they destroyed half of it. Uh, it's a permanent exhibition, and I just wanted to say that we cannot do something for a monument dedicated to war without considering what does it mean to do something about a monument dedicated to war. So, of course, I told them, let's talk about the history of the monument. And I made a project about the history of the monument. But at the end, at the end, the day they decided to make the advertisement in the street, I told them, you know, the real topic about this is the symbolic of the monuments, and this is what, how the monument was hesitating between war and peace, and what happened about that. And then, even the official people working on this, even the army part of that, just accepted that the title would be Between War and Peace. 
and, and everything, every content that is actually really questioning the intention and what history has made of the monument has become uh, discussed at that time. So I consider, in a way, I had an impact, not only because there are 1 million and 500,000 people coming every year, but also because uh, people in Paris that used not, never to talk about the monument starting to talk, started to talk about it and to consider what does it mean, this big thing in the middle that people consider as a piece of a photography experiment for tourists uh, that is actually uh, full of other symbols and uh, intention. So I did a lot of work on decoding the thing, and I think this worked. One of the consequences is uh, we moved a half of it to put a, card, a postcard shop, uh, which is, uh, of course, a half failure. But at least I could do it, I could, I could do it and it, it lasts, uh, let's say, three years like that. But it's not the, the best impact I would like. Honestly, I would like things like uh, emotion forecasts and so on to have more impact. But it's difficult to say what can be the impact. But I've been talking with traders and people working in this field, and I can tell you, I don't know if this will change their vision of the work, but this was a very good opportunity to talk about it. And curiously, they were pretty um, interested by this discussion. But it can be a pretext to discussion as well. And now we should pick up the best one question and give a present. Yeah. No, don't ask what, me. What was, <laughs> what was the best one? No, no, one? no, you, you, can, you, cannot, you cannot ask me that. No, because you can say, oh, yeah, this one was uh, uh, nice with him and this one was very aggressive and so on. And, and, and so I, can, I cannot do that. <laughs> Can you decide? Why? So, what was the best question? There is a gift for the best question. Which one? The last one? How many things is the last one that was uh, the best question? Ah, it's not bad. Okay, good. The last one. Подойдите к нам, пожалуйста. Мы вам подарим 4G роутер от Мегафона нашего инновационного партнера. Всем спасибо. Давайте еще раз поаплодируем и проводим лектора. До свидания. Спасибо, что пришли.